Tonight, what I want to do is uh, hopefully talk through some more, pla uh, more practical ways. What do you do with the Psalms? You're not a Bible scholar. You're not trying to be a teacher. You are working hard. You've got some children or grandchildren. What good is it other than just general reading through? Like hopefully you have a Bible reading plan. I would recommend that every year. Have a Bible reading plan. You can get through the Bible each year so that, you know, five years, 10 years, 20 years down the road, you've gone through the Bible 20 times. That's really, really good. It's constant eating. Excellent. But what about some of the crises we run into? <clears throat> some of the problems, some of the unexpected events that happen. I think the Psalms are especially good for those things. And so tonight, what I hope to do is maybe point out a couple, uh, go through them, say, talk through how you might use them for crises. And then when we get done with that, I want to turn the page over, take a step back, and then do a run toward, uh, I want you to see the sequence. Okay, ours is my phone. So whoever got the train phone, cut that off. <laughs> Were y'all here last week when the train went off while I'm talking? All right, go ahead get the train and whatever else. Go ahead and, and cut it off. Uh, anyway, I, I want to take the Psalms and just do a 10 steps through uh, how the Psalms have this messianic, uh, not only flavor and feel, but show us Jesus. So several points to use by way of application, and then we'll move over to the Messiah. Let's pray and we'll get started. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we thank you that you've brought us through this day in the middle of the week, your constant provision. We thank you for the people that you've put in our lives, how our paths have crossed under your sovereign hand, how you have brought friends into our life, how under a hard providence you take people out of our life. We, th we trust you with all of that. We pray that tonight you would, um, you would use this to not only bring comfort, you would use our time to strengthen our souls, to strengthen our resolve. We pray that you would help us. You would find us faithful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As World War II came to a close, the Lutheran pastor named Dietrich Bonhoeffer, it would be worth your while to read about him, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, as the Allies closed in on the Nazi regime, it was falling apart, and the Allies were closing in, and Bonhoeffer is still alive. He had been part of a plot to assassinate Hitler. He was part of the Confessing Church, the church that actually held on to the gospel. He would die a martyr, a hero. That's why I would recommend reading about him. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, in his cell, wrote a poem, Who Am I? It would be worth you looking it up. I'm not going to quote it. You can probably find it online. Who Am I? is the name of the poem, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Before he died, Dietrich Bonhoeffer found strength in the Psalms. And what he said was, is that the Psalms should be prayed in their entirety. You go through, 150 of them. Go through, pray the Psalms in their entirety. Why? Because they mirror life's ups and downs. Just started a new book by uh, Rosaria Butterfield. Uh, it is astounding. If you know anything about Rosaria Butterfield, she starts off on page one and you get hit in the mouth as soon as you start reading what this woman writes. She's writing about the culture. Her, the name of the book is Five Lies of Our Anti-Christian Age. Five Lies. I'm going to make sure it's in our bookstore in the next couple of weeks. I would recommend it to all, all of you. I would recommend it to young marrieds, young single women. It, it's, a, it's a great, great book. Rosaria Butterfield says that she was, uh, she was a lesbian. She was an atheist. She was a, a, not even a theologically li liberal. She was a complete politically Everything you can come up with by way of being a, li a liberal, that's what she was. She had been coerced and talked into coming to a church. It happened to be a Presbyterian church and a very conservative Presbyterian church where they were singing the Psalms. 
They don't sing like we do in church songs that have been written by other people. They just sing the Bible at the church she visited. And she says that it was when they were singing Psalm 113 that her soul was gripped by her own sinfulness, God's holiness, and there she heard the gospel. How are we going to use the Psalms? I want to use them for several ways. We'll flip through, maybe pick up a couple of things to read and uh, see how they might be practical for you. Number one, I think you need to use the Psalms for praying. Psalms for praying. Use the Psalms for prayer. Donald Whitney wrote a book called uh, Praying the Bible. It's a good way to learn how to pray, praying the Bible. And he spends lots of, times talk, lots of time talking about the Psalms. If you're going to pray the Psalms, you would take Psalm 4, for instance. Psalm 4, verse 1. The psalmist says, answer me. This is, he's talking to the Lord. Answer me when I call, O God. Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You've given me relief when I was in distress. Be gracious and hear my prayer. That's one way to start a prayer. Or come down the page in verse 6 of Psalm chapter 4. By the way, if you have your Bible, we're going we're gonna to stay there, but we're going to be flipping in the Psalms. If uh, you don't, you can probably pull it up on your phone. I'll try to give you time to get there. I want you to see it for yourself. Psalm chapter 4, uh, verse 6, 7, and 8. There are many who say, who will show us some good? Lift up the light of your face upon us, O Lord. You have put more joy in my heart than when they have their grain and wine abound in peace. I will both lie down and sleep for you alone, O Lord. Make me dwell in safety. I read that to you because oftentimes we want to pray. We don't know how to pray. Don't know how to even start praying. First two churches I uh, pastored. And by the way, a lot of you wonder, why, why are you always dressed up? When I was 23 years old, I started pastoring a church. I sounded like an ex-college athlete when I talked, like a meathead is what I sounded like. And I was young, I was the youngest, youngest pastor in Lincoln County, Mississippi. And I was trying to think of a way to actually get respect. I started dressing up. Uh, when I went to visit the hospitals and went to see senior adults, and it just sort of stuck because now it's easy. You don't have to have much sense. Uh, it's one color. There's a second color. There's a third. You got it covered. <laughs> but a lot of us don't know how, to, know how to pray. In the early church that I served, oftentimes men that had been there all of their lives, when it came time to have the offering, the offertory song would be sung. And uh, as you get to the last stanza, two men would come down with, their, with the plates, come down to the Lord's Supper table and stand there. The song is over, and it would be on me to call on one of them to pray spontaneously. So I would say, Mr. Wells, would you say the prayer? Mr. Wells would start praying, and every single week, it would be the same exact prayer. You find yourself doing that a lot of times, I'm sure. If you use the words lead, guide, and direct, you, you, you do that in your prayer. We pray a hedge of protection. We pray for traveling mercies. All of those are good things. But when you start reading the Psalms, what happens is that there's a depth to your prayer, an accuracy. The economy of language starts to come into your heart and mind. And you speak the very words of God back to God himself. So when you don't know how to pray, one of the things you can do is open up the Psalms and read them to the Lord. It should be used for prayer. Let me give you another use. Uh, the Psalms should be used for, for worship, for worship. Let me show you a good Psalm, Psalm 96, a good one for worship, right in the middle. Psalm 96. Is it cold in here, do y'all? Yeah, do you see me sweating up here? <laughs> I know that it's cold, and I don't know why it's so hot uh, to me. I think it's probably, this is a really, really cheap suit. And I think that it's so, so much polyester in it that it's just hot. That's actually the truth. All right, Psalm 96. Let me take it there. Verses 1, 2, 3. The psalmist says, Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless His name. Tell of His salvation from day to day. Declare His glory among the nations. His marvelous works among the peoples. That right there is worship. 
you come to Hickory Grove on a Sunday morning, uh, we, we are not strictly guided by what is known as the regulative principle. Regulative principle. We are, however, in principle guided by that. So there is a, a, a method to what we do, and it comes from the Psalms. That we begin the service with a, a, a word of God. The call to worship is not me or someone else saying, hey, y'all come worship. The call to worship is the actual Psalms or, or, or some scripture that is close to a psalm. We should use the uh, Psalms for worship. If your heart is cold, if you as a Christian have grown sort of dead inside, one of the ways to ignite your heart is to go slowly reading the Psalms and savor every word in the Psalms. There's not a person here in this room, if you're a vibrant, growing Christian, that at some point you, have, you haven't just felt some of that deadness. And the Psalms are, are a great tool to, to warm your heart to worship, to worship. I would say that that leads to the third one. Uh, you need to use the Psalms for cultivating a hunger for God, a hunger for God, so that we don't hunger for trash. Like I was reading uh, earlier what Rosaria wrote in this book, and it just was, it was convicting, it was, it's true, that we need more Bible than you need Internet and TikTok. You need more Bible than you need Facebook. You need more Bible than you, than you watch TV. Like I think about the, the time I spend in God's Word. What is the amount of time, the actual time I spend in God's Word compared to the time I spend in, in other junk. And so Rosario made me think about that today. And, and the Psalms are a great tool to cultivate because a hunger for God is not natural for us. What is natural for us and the natural man is a hunger for trash. We won't jump. We won't sin. Or we want what's easy. A hunger for God is something that has to be, has to be cultivated over time. So don't be shocked if, if when you are converted that you are not immediately wishing you were having your face in the Bible all the time. It has to be, has to be cultivated. And we do that with the Psalms. A couple of them. I just read some. Psalm uh, 27 is a good place to be. Psalm 27. Psalm 27, verse 4. <clears throat> One thing I have asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. I mean, do you, do you see the, the worship of, okay, I want to look and, and, and examine and think about. And then I want to ask questions. Like sometimes we think us for, for worship is just standing and basking. And some of that is true. And it, it has this real ethereal feel. When in fact worship is informed. And the more we are informed, the more we know about God, the more we want to worship Him. That's what the Psalms do. Tell us about God. Psalm 27, 4 is a good one. Psalm 42 uh, it starts out, you probably, probably know it, as the deer pants for the water brook, so my soul pants for thee, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and, and kneel before God and my tears? I mean, it's just, just a, such a poetic, beautiful way of getting your heart ready and getting your heart hungry for God. Because if you're not careful, if you don't cultivate a hunger for God, you cultivate a hunger for stuff. You cultivate a hunger for money. You cultivate a, a hunger for prestige. You cultivate a hunger for ease. You cultivate a hunger for uh, your children being happy and healthy and wise. But you're good things. But it's not God, you see. When you cult cultivate a hunger for God, what happens is all of the other things start to fall out exactly right. And even when they don't, 
When terrible things happen, when people treat you poorly, when life falls apart, when the car won't start, your hunger for God has been satisfied and those other things are not throwing you off, you, off the path. Psalms help with that. Let me give you a fourth thing. You ought to use the Psalms during deep sadness. Psalms during deep sadness. There are enough people in this room right here that are old enough. I see enough white hair and lack of hair in this room right now <laughs> that you have, you have experienced like some soul-crushing sadness. You've, you've been alive long enough. You've gone through something. And you have found out uh, how good the Psalms are when it comes to, like I, I just quoted part of Psalm 42. Let's go to Psalm 42 again. Psalm 42. <laughs> Psalm 42 and 43. They go together, by the way. They are written as a pair. So you shouldn't read Psalm 42 without Psalm 43. They're hand in hand. And watch, watch how it goes. So you, you're here at book two. This is to the choir master. It's a maskil from the sons of Korah. And watch as the psalmist reasons. As the deer pants for the flowing streams, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night. While they are saying to me all day long, where is your God? What a, what a profound. It keeps going though. These things I remember. I remember when it was good. As I'm pouring out my soul. I remember how I would go in, with the throng to lead them in procession. I'd go to the house of God, be shouts of of joy, songs of praise, a multitude keeping festival. I remember the good times even as I'm going through the bad. And sometimes remembering the good times makes the bad times worse. And he keeps asking himself, I mean, this psalmist, why are you cast down on my soul? Why are you in turmoil? Now he's coming out. He's going to come out. Hope in God. It'll happen again. Sun will shine again. Clouds will go away. Hope in God, for I shall again praise Him, my salvation and my God. Keep going. My soul is cast down within me, therefore I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon, from Mount Mizmar, deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls, all your breakers and your waves have gone over me. I've been overwhelmed and, and God was doing it. It's a hard providence. It's a sad providence. It's a frowning providence, but it's still a providence. By day, the Lord commands his steadfast love and at night his song is with me. A prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go on mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a deadly wound in my bones, my, my adversaries taunt me while they say to me all day long, where is your God? Now he's coming back to his senses now. Why are you cast down on my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God. It'll happen again. I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. 43, I mean, uh, chapter 43. Vindicate me, O God. Defend my cause against an ungodly people from the deceitful and the unjust man. Deliver me, for you are the God in whom I take refuge. Why have you rejected me? Why do I go about mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill, to your dwelling. Then... Then I will go to the altar of God and to my exceeding joy. I will praise you with the lyre, O God, my God. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. It's a, it's a great psalm. The psalms take us 
with empathy, you can read and think, okay, that's how I feel. That's how I feel. My tears have been my food day and night. I've been crying so much that, it's, that, I'm, that I'm drinking it. And it's been going on for days. And even in such a brokenhearted spot, the psalmist takes us and, and brings us to the point to say, put your hope in God. Use the Psalms when you're in deep sadness. Let me give you a fifth thing. How many of these we got? Ten? No, I did 15. I got to pick it up a little bit. All right. Y'all are slowing me down. Let's go. Number five. <clears throat> we need to use the Psalms when, uh, when the wicked prosper. When, when you can understand why is it that bad people have the good stuff? Why are they doing so well? Psalm 37. Uh, back up a little bit. Psalm 37, 7, 8, and 9. <clears throat> be still before the Lord wait patiently for him fret not yourself over one who prospers in his way for the man who carries out evil devices refrain from anger forsake wrath fret not yourself it tends only to evil for the evil doers they will be cut off but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land we need to use the Psalms to cultivate gratitude in our hearts because we are prone to complain. Every one of you here are prone to complain. The traffic was bad. You know why? I heard somebody complaining about it. Actually, no, it's, I don't know if it's bad or not, but that, that's what happens. You come in, we talk about how things have affected God in our way in some capacity. And it's good for us to fight that with a heart of gratitude. The Psalms do that. Psalm 33 is, is one to choose. Psalm 33. Shout for joy in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with a lyre. Make melody to him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. Something I would recommend to you. Find a way to get what we do on Sunday mornings, the music we sing, the songs that we sing, and get them into your heart and mind and sing them during the week. And so that that becomes part of who you are because the songs that we are singing are not love songs that could be sung to a person. They are either prayers to God or about God and they're good for our soul and they come right from the Bible. Let me give you something else. <clears throat> Psalm 61, you need to use the Psalms when you feel overwhelmed. Or I, I, let me just... I'm going to just pick it up because I, I want you to see the Messianic Psalms. I'm going to point them out as we go, okay? The Psalms when you feel overwhelmed. Psalm 61 is a beautiful psalm. Uh, the, you need to use the Psalms when you are anxious. We live in a world now where so many of our young people, we have so many young people that are dealing with panic attacks and feeling anxious. It, it is a, a phenomenon that has happened. I don't know what all the contributing factors are. I do know that right now... I, I think it is harder to be a Christian in 2024 than it was in 1984. I just think it's harder for people that are coming into young adulthood. I just think it's harder. We at least had some people would recognize uh, objective truth. It's not recognized anymore. And so there's a lot of anxiousness. I think Psalm 91 verses 1 and 2 is a beautiful psalm to, to read slowly to an anxious heart. If you have an anxious heart, you feel a panic attack going on, uh, coming on. Psalm 91, I think, will help the Christian soul to be centered. Let me just read that. <clears throat> he who dwells, <clears throat> don't you know this psalm? He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, look at the words of confidence, my refuge, my fortress, my God, in whom I trust. I'm dwelling in the shelter of the Most High. I'm abiding in the shadow of the Almighty. It's good for you to get those thoughts in your mind and heart. The Word of God becomes like a medicine to calm. You need to use the Psalms when we're anxious. We need to use the Psalms when, uh, when you're dealing with 
with sin. <clears throat> when you are dealing with your own sin, we, we all deal with our own sin. We, we are Christians because we trust that Jesus took the punishment for our sins, took our sin at the cross, gave us his righteousness, and yet we all, we all battle this week. Today you've battled some sin. And sometimes that sin wins. And it's good for us to stop and think and deal with it. Deal with it in a Christian way. We don't dismiss our sin. We don't carry the shame and guilt around and let it be, make it so that it just destroys us. We do what the psalmist did in Psalm 51. The psalmist is David. The context is David and Bathsheba. It is a heinous event. Uh, you know the story well, I'm sure. With David and Bathsheba, the adultery that happened, not only the adultery, but the murder, the shame that it brought on the king of Israel. David is supposed to be the picture and foreshadowing of Messiah, and, and, and we find him in this terrible sin. And Psalm 51 is a beautiful way to deal. Like if you don't know how to pray and talk about your own sin to God, Psalm 51 is a good way to do it. The psalmist says, Have mercy on me, O God. According to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. See how the focus is on God and not on us? According to your steadfast love and your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Do you, do you see how you can think of the cross here as Christians? What Christ does for us, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin. You, you know Psalm 51, you know it well. Read it slowly. Claim it as your own. And, and, and we deal with sin in forgiveness and restoration and taking shame away. And you think about David's life and how God then used him. Use the Psalms. When you are struggling with sin or you are carrying the guilt of it or you've not confessed that sin, use the Psalms to help you get, get there and find yourself at the cross. Number 10. <clears throat> We need to use the Psalms when you're feeling desperate. When you're feeling desperate. Psalm 121. <clears throat> Psalm 121. There, there may come a time in your life when you feel like, uh, like you're completely wiped out. Like you're completely gutted. I wouldn't, want to, I wouldn't want to have to go through tragedy and not have a church family and uh, a Christian community. Like, you know, kind of, kind of and I are pretty fresh off what happened with Nate. And, and the, some of the blessings that come out of that is I have never experienced such an outpouring of support and affection and prayer. So I, I don't know what people do that aren't connected to a church to a church that loves one another. But I do know that even in the church, there are times, even as, as your community you have, and a lot of you are connected in community, there are times when you just get, I mean, something happens and it knocks the breath out of you. And it's good to go to the Psalms. Psalm 121 is a great one. The text says, I will, I will lift up my eyes. It's even an ascent song. I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come is the question and the answer is immediate. My help comes from the Lord. He's the one who created everything, made the heavens and the earth. That's a good one to, to, to mark in your Bible. File it away when you are gut punched. Use the Psalms when you are feeling desperate. How about this? You need to uh, use the Psalms when everyone is against you, when you feel like everyone is against you. <clears throat> if you work out of this bubble of the church, so I work in a bubble. I know that. A lot of you don't work in this bubble. You work outside of this bubble. That's where you exist. You can feel like the lone person like the lone Christian in the environment that you're in. Psalm uh, chapter 71 is a good one to think through. Psalm 71. <clears throat> I 
<clears throat> goes like this. In, in, in you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be to me a rock of refuge of which I may continually come. You have given the command to save me. You are my rock and my fortress. When everybody is again, here's another, when you feel forgotten, you need to use the Psalm, Psalm 13. Flip all the way back to the Psalm 13. <clears throat> when you feel forgotten. Here's one to just, here's one to pray. How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day long? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O oh Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart will rejoice in your salvation. How about when you're tempted? Number 13. Uh, use the Psalms when you're tempted. A great one is Psalm chapter 1. Psalm chapter 1. A lot of you have that one memorized, I bet. It's pretty easy because it's tiered. Psalm chapter 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked. Don't walk in the counsel of the wicked. Nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. The psalmist takes us right there. How do you fight off temptation? It's God's word. How are you you're strengthened? If God is sovereign and he is in control, and he is, and you find yourself in temptation, the Bible has promised that with that comes a route of escape. There's, there's nothing that you're going to be tempted with that's not common to all people. God has given you the ability to, to, to have those victories over and over again and to grow in the Lord. Not, not into perfection, but because you are a saint now, you will grow and have some of those. You get stronger, things that you used to fall to, you don't fall to anymore. And the way that you uh, grow is through, one way is using the Psalms. Use the Psalms when you're tempted. How about Psalm 6? <clears throat> Use the Psalms when you are exhausted. Exhausted. Anybody here exhausted? Raise your hand. Brian, I know you are. Exhausted. Who else? Raise your hand. Are you too tired to raise your hand? I see you in the back. Exhausted. Just absolutely. Like, don't you feel that sometimes? I've... Like, kind of, and I, I don't know if it was just grief, just have, like, just exhausted. What do you do, though? Because you got to keep going. I mean, you got to keep working. You got all these responsibilities. You can't quit. Can't stop. People are dependent on you. Psalm, Psalm, uh, Psalm 6 is a good one to go to. Psalm chapter 6. O Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor dis discipline me in your wrath. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am languishing. Worn, that word, I am completely worn out. And the prayer is, be gracious to me. Like, I'm, I've come to the actual end of my physical rope. I am reminded of my dependence, that I am a mortal person. Each night when I lie down, I'm reminded that I have to have sleep. That there will come a time when I lie down like that for the very last time. This, this psalm is a reminder. The tiredness is a reminder. The tiredness is a tap on our shoulder that says, you are not God. You need God. And the psalmist says, Lord... Rebuke me not in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am languishing. Heal me. 
this has to be something inside. Heal me because my bones, my bones are troubled. My soul is troubled. But you, oh Lord, I mean, there's, a, there's an element of faith. I know you can heal me. How long will it be? And then, then he turns, it turned to me and deliver my life. Save me for the sake of your steadfast love. For in death, this is before we have the picture of the full revelation of Jesus Christ and the resurrection. In death, there's no remembrance of you. In Sheol, who will praise you? I am weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with weeping. My eyes waste away. Depart from me, all you evil workers, or you workers of evil. This is verse 8. For the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. The Lord has heard my plea. The Lord accepts my prayer. All my enemies shall be ashamed, greatly troubled. They will turn back and be put to shame in a moment. When you get tired and exhausted, one thing happens is uh, you're, you're, you fall to temptation easier. That's why, that's why being out after 11 or 12 at night is bad. You're tired and your temptations are more and you're going to fall to them. That's why people look at pornography in the dark and late, tired. At the end of the day, you're, you're falling to temptation. And the psalmist says, I need the, the healing power of, of God. It's a reminder. When you get exhausted, let that exhaustion be a reminder of your need for God. And also use the psalms... Uh, in times of mourning, times of mourning. That's why they're so good at the funerals, right? That's why you have Psalm 23. A lot of you quoted it. It was like uh, doing a responsive reading uh, last week when we quoted the 23rd Psalm. Uh, chapter 16, preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. Down to verse 8, I have set the Lord always before me. He is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One seek corruption. The Psalms are really great for any number of things. A lot of times, though, in crisis, they serve to heal our souls. Keep the Psalms very close. I, part of my devotional reading is I have a plan. I work, work, try to work through the Bible. And then I'll, after I work through most of it, then I'll come back. And uh, right now I'm trying to read a few Psalms. And I'll start my devotional reading in the morning. I'll always start it with a Psalm because it gets my heart ready for what the Lord might say to me through his word. Okay, so with that put aside, before we go, about 10, 10 minutes or so, I want to just show you some fascinating things about the Psalms. The Psalms are used for worship, certainly, but the Psalms are filled with messianic references. Like if you were to go and just, just Google that, be careful what website you go to. It's a wild world out there. But if, messianic references in the Psalms. And you can find hundreds if you look. In fact, uh, 77 times. 77 times in the Psalms. 77 times the Psalms are mentioned in the New Testament. Most of the times in the Gospel. And most of those are Messianic Psalms. Let me just take you through a journey of the Messianic Psalms. I'll just, I just picked 10. I could have picked 100. But 10 that stand out to me. And ten that are referenced in the New Testament. Do y'all have that in front of you? It should have uh, Old Testament and then the title, then the New Testament, where it's found. Do y'all have? Is that what it looks like in here? Okay. All right. Let's go. Let's go quickly. Psalm uh, chapter two. <clears throat> Psalm chapter two, verse seven, speaks of Christ as the Son of God. You find that same quote in Matthew chapter three, verse seventeen. And it goes like this, I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you recognize this from Matthew 3? 
The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. That's the Psalms being quoted to speak of Jesus as the Son of God. Turn the page. Psalm chapter 8. Psalm chapter 8, verse 2. Psalm chapter 8, verse 2 has Jesus being praised by children. This psalm is played out in Matthew chapter 21, verses 5 and 6. You can go and read it later. But in Psalm chapter 8, verse 2... Out of the mouth of babes and infants you have established strength because of your foes to steal the enemy and the avenger. So if you take your Bible, Psalm chapter 8 verse 2, and you might see a little number there or a letter, you can look down in the apparatus at the bottom of the page and probably it quotes or says this is quoted in Matthew chapter 21. So you have this being this being a picture of and spoken of about Jesus. Okay, he's the son of God. He's praised by children. Psalm chapter 8 verse 6 tells us that he is the ruler of all. The writer of Hebrews picks this up. Sometimes he's in Leviticus. He puts Leviticus down. He goes over to the Psalms. And this is what he says. Psalm chapter 8 verse 6. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. That's a New Testament writer quoting the Old Testament to speak of Jesus being the ruler over all. Now let's go to the Passion. What is the Passion? The Passion is the last scene of Jesus. I'm in Mark chapter 7 preaching on Sundays. <clears throat> this Sunday I'm preaching on the Syrophoenician woman uh, who has this conversation with Jesus. She wants Jesus to come and cast the demon out of her, her little girl. And they have this strange conversation where Jesus says to her, we don't give the children's food to the dogs. And she says, even the dogs under the table get, get the crumbs. It's a striking, it's a striking picture, but it's at the, the beginning of the end of the earthly life of Jesus. So let's start there. Jesus betrayed by a friend. You'll find it in Psalm 41. Psalm 41, verse 9. Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. You find that corresponding chapter, Luke chapter 22, verse 47. The passion of the Christ begins with the betrayal of a friend. You feel betrayed? Jesus was betrayed. The passion uh, continues to the crucifixion. Psalm chapter 22 is the most vivid Old Testament account of the crucifixion 700 years before the crucifixion. When you read Psalm chapter 22, we talked about this a little bit last week. I mean, you even hear Jesus quote it. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from me? You come down the page, uh, verse 12, many bulls encompass me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water. My bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet, I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. That is the exact thing that happened in Matthew chapter 27. You go and read Matthew 27, it'll sound just like that. How is it that God tied this together, gave that to us 700 years before, before crucifixion was even invented? You have a picture of what's, what's coming. This is a messianic psalm. So you have the betrayal of a friend, crucifixion. We have from the psalms, him rising from the dead. Here's resurrection. A, a view that in God's progressive revelation, we've not yet seen a complete picture of it in the Old Testament. And yet, Psalm 16, verse 10. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol. That's the grave, or it could be translated hell. Or let your Holy One see corruption. 
So you have betrayed by a friend. You have him crucified, dead, buried, raised from the dead. How about him ascending into heaven? There's a psalm for that. Psalm 68. <clears throat> psalm 68, verse 18. You ascended on high, leading a host of captives in your train and receiving gifts among men, even among the rebellious, that the Lord God may dwell there. You, you know that that's, a, that's quoted uh, partially in Hebrews and then in Acts chapter 1, verses 9, 10, and 11 is the picture of the ascension. So in the Psalms we have him being betrayed by Judas, him being crucified, dead and buried, him being raised from the dead, him ascending into heaven. Now the psalmist tells us he is the eternal king. Eternal king. Psalm 45, verse 6. <clears throat> Your throne, O God, is forever. Here's, here's, you find that in Hebrews, don't you? Hebrews 1, uh, 1 verse 8. Uh, in fact, Hebrews chapter 1 is the very first chapter I ever memorized. It was 15 years ago. Don't ask me to quote it, but I did memorize it then. And this is what he says uh, in Psalm 45, verse 6. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The chapter of the scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of righteousness. That is quoted in Hebrews as the writer of Hebrews gives us a picture of Jesus Christ as the eternal king. He reaches back to the Psalms. Psalm uh, 110.1 is a picture of Christ ruling over his enemies. Take a big chunk and pull all the way over to Psalm 110. <clears throat> the reason we get this is because in Matthew chapter 20, this psalm is used to prove that Jesus Christ rules over his enemies. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And I'll just, uh, I'll close with the writer of Hebrews using Jesus as a priest forever. Remember that whole Melchizedek? I preached through Hebrews and I got there and I mean, it's really something to show how Christ is in a different line from the Aaronic uh, priesthood and how he serves as the perfect priest forever, the intercessor for us. This is our Christian hope, by the way, that we have access to God through Jesus. And the psalmist, or the, the writer of Hebrews, reaches over to Psalm 110, verse 4. And he said, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Genesis, Psalms, Hebrews. All taking us to Jesus Christ who is our intercessor forever. You read the Psalms. Use them for your life. Use them for the crises. Use them for worship. Use them to, to fill your soul. Use the Psalms to remind you that Jesus Christ is Lord and he reigns forever. Thank you, guys. Thank you for staying with me through the Psalms. We'll gather together next Wednesday and go right into Proverbs. Read a proverb a day uh, during the month. You can get through the book of Proverbs once a month for a year. You can get it 12 times in a year. Try it sometime. Read the corresponding proverb to the day. Today is September the what? 13th. You could read Proverbs 13. Get ready for it next week. You guys pray for me tomorrow. I uh, travel to Greensboro. There is a, uh, a large church pastor's retreat. So pastor, guys that pastor large churches, uh, they've asked me to come and, and uh, speak on, on expository preaching and how to do that in the context of a large church providing leadership. So Anyway, pray that it goes well, that I don't embarrass us, that I say something that's helpful uh, to other pastors over there. All right, let's close, and uh, we'll be dismissed. <clears throat> Father, thank you for the men and women here that are hungry for your word, that love your word. Thank you for the healing effect of, of your word. Thank you for the strengthening effect. Well, we pray that strength for our children and for the students here. God, that you would strengthen their hearts and their souls, that they would love you above all things. Help us to be families and a church that support and press our students to love God and to be strong. Make us strong, Lord. 
in this world, make us strong to stand joyfully for the truth, to do so with our eyes on Jesus Christ. And we thank you for it. Go with us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.